Good morning, my name is Jack Dangerman and I wanna welcome all of you back to the day two of the ESRI International Users Conference. This has been an amazing conference so far with dozens and dozens of technical sessions uh, where people are sharing their work, learning sessions, and uh, we're making progress. Listen, today we're gonna to be sharing from uh, four amazing speakers, their experiences and also their vision and also their practical work of how we can create a more sustainable planet. The first of these is Paul Selipak, who is actually walking around the world experiencing firsthand with people on the ground, what it's like to confront in various situations in various countries, the changes that are occurring on our planet with climate change, with changes in migration, uh, and we'll hear his experiences. He's coming to us from China. So, Paul, you want to take it away? Hello, my name is Paul Salopek, and I'm the person walking around the world with the Out of Eden Walk Project. It's a great joy to be among you here at the annual Esri Conference um, to talk a little bit about um, what it's like to transect the world today in the age of the Anthropocene by foot at about 30 inches a stride or about three miles an hour or five kilometers an hour. So let me talk to you a little bit about um, what I'm seeing and what I can share as we all walk collectively, because that's the way I think of my project, that we're all walking together into a challenging 21st century. I titled my walk, The Out of Eden Walk, using the term Eden in an intentionally vague way. I mean, you, if you're a person of faith, I respect that. If you're an anthropologist, I respect that as well. But in the context of my project, I am talking archeologically and paleoanthropologically about the human birthplace, the cradle of humankind, the mother continent of Africa, that we all spread out of, somebody back in our past, in our collective family trees, walked out of many, many thousands of years ago. My project is about um, art and science, and it's using the medium of walking to connect both. So back in January of 2013, I walked out of the Rift Valley of Africa with the idea of recreating, rewalking, the original dispersal of ancient humans across the world, all the way from the mother continent to the very tippity tip of South America, which scientists tell us is one of the last horizons that our ancestors laid eyes on. This is a journey of about 24,000 miles, a journey of upwards of 70 million footsteps, a journey that will take 14 or 15 years of my life. And it's been an absolute delight and revelation and a, a humbling experience to be able to do this. I'm now in year eight. I'm talking to you from Shanghai, China, where I am preparing to launch the walk across this vast and complex and diverse country from the Southwest to the Northeast. China alone will take me about 18 months to walk across and the kilometers here are about 6,000. It's gonna be a remarkable once in a lifetime journey, couched within an even bigger once in a lifetime journey for me. And I'd like to invite you all along as map makers, as people who are thinking about how we again move together into a sustainable future, right? The theme of sustainability comes up organically on my walk again and again without me even trying to think about it. It's very concrete, it's not an abstraction. How do we survive together as we inch into an unknown future that is looking very uncertain? Think about the bottlenecks that we all face in the coming century, whether it's climate change, whether it's conflict, whether it's these vast income inequalities that span not just communities, but continents. Think about the mass migrations that all of these factors um, trigger, pushing people away from violence or poverty and pulling them towards a more um, peaceful and uh, economically just horizon ahead. I have walked through all of these headlines. I've walked through all of these stories. And the idea of the walk is not just to slow myself down. This is an experiment, a global experiment in, in slow journalism, but to see how all of these massive topics and issues are connected. 
because I believed as a foreign correspondent um, that I was moving too quickly in the past and that I would get the story, wherever the story was, whether it was point A or point B, but not only was I missing out on the entire alphabet of stories in between by flying over them, but even more importantly, I wasn't seeing how every story in the world is connected to another story, how an economic story is connected to a political story, how an education story might be connected to, cl to climate change or to conflict. If you pull hard enough on any story that you hear, whether you see it on the TV news or you hear it over a, over a beer with your friend, that story is connected to another story, that it is self-connected to another story, all the way over the horizon. And the Out of Eden Walk has been this amazing vehicle for me personally, and I hope for my, my readers and my audience, of just showing how interconnected all of these stories and all of us who inhabit these stories really are. So I titled my talk, A Walk Through the Anthropocene, because now more than ever, in a, in a digital age when we've kind of melded into a global um, hive mind through this amazing technology that I'm using to even to talk to all of you, um, our fates are more interconnected than ever. Um, let me just give you um, some examples and some lessons about how we um, might be able to think about moving through the Anthropocene, the human-made age, the age of humanity altering nature more than ever before. Um, and how we may, hopefully by learning from each other, navigate through major questions of sustainability as, as, as we go through our lives into the new century, into a new millennium. I was thinking and preparing for this talk that what have I learned at boot level from the ordinary people that I meet along the way? What lessons have I picked up after walking, what is it now? Gosh, it's it's... 11,000 miles, what is that, more than 21, 22,000 kilometers, I think. It's 8,000 days and nights plus of moving across the world. The things that I've learned happen in very small packages, in the package of a hum an individual human story, one person that I meet. The first people that I walked with walking out of Africa, to give one example, are the Afar pastoralists, they're camel herders who move their animals up and down the Rift Valley of Africa. And watching them navigate that part of the world, which is undergoing enormous climate change right now, fickle rains are getting more unpredictable, pasture land is shriveling up, water holes are drying out. Their entire way of being, this, this pastoral economy of movement, of moving animals across an unreliable landscape, is becoming increasingly untenable and pushing them into cities like never before. So a whole way of life is thinning out and vanishing. What they taught me when I walked with these folks who um, would walk 25, 30 kilometers a day across a very arid landscape in northern Ethiopia is they were always alert. They're alert like a hunter is alert. Even when they're walking, their head is swiveling around, constantly scanning the horizons for clouds because wherever there are clouds, there's likely to be cloud bursts and rainfall. And by the time you walk to that cloud shadow, the beginnings of grass will be coming up for your animals. I watched how they walked physically with their bodies. They barely lifted their feet, just almost seemed like a micron off the desert surface. And they had this kind of low slung shuffle that I, in my imagination, think is kind of an eternal walk, a walk that will keep them going despite narrowing resources far into the future. So that's one example of learning from the people that I met along the way about methodologies, cultures, even the physicality of getting through um, thinning resources, resources that are getting scarcer and scarcer. Learning by example, person to person. I walked with these folks for about 400 kilometers until I reached the Gulf of Aden. And then I took a camel ship to the Levant, to the Middle East, and walk through the Middle East, through Saudi Arabia, into Jordan. And there was another example, another community of people that I learned from about how to survive in extremis, how to survive in tight straits. In this community were the 600,000 plus um, Syrian refugees taking refuge in the, in the country of Jordan, many of them living in refugee camps, others hiring their muscles out 
is farm laborers for just a few dollars a day to pick tomatoes. And what I learned from that community about the day and age that we live in is how sharing and compassion is vital to our communal survival. These folks had almost nothing. I would walk into their um, communities. I would walk through agricultural fields and see their, their tents. And invariably, they would invite me in to share whatever they had. Often, it was just a cup of tea or maybe a pile of freshly picked tomatoes. And I remember them joking with me, saying, we wish we, wish we had chicken to offer you. We dream about chicken, but all we eat is tomatoes. We have, we have fresh tomatoes. We have pickled tomatoes. We have boiled tomatoes. Welcome to our world. But I have never experienced in my life anything like those weeks where I walked among people who had almost nothing and they shared everything with me. And that was such a, um, a soul feeding experience that I'll always carry with me as another example of what walking across the world has, has taught me about getting through our age of uncertainty, getting through this um, brand new era called the Anthropocene. Share what you have, help the other. Another example, a little further along, after walking through the Middle East and across the Caucasus, um, would be Central Asia. I spent two and a half years walking across the old Silk Roads of Central Asia, walking across Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and then over the Karakoram Mountains into Pakistan. What I learned going across those bronze-colored steps was yet another lesson in mobility, right? A lesson in the power of movement as a survival mechanism in hard times, and not just as refugees, not just as pastoral nomads, but the power of movement of ideas. Because as I did my research, as I did my homework about my stories about the Silk Road, what began to dawn on me as I walked through these formerly glorious cities like Hiva, Bukhara, Samarkand, is that they thrived not only because they controlled trade routes to the, the main commodity that's come down to us, which is silk, but they were crossroads of ideas that made their societies blossom and bloom during medieval times, and they became global centers of culture and learning that far eclipsed the levels of learning in places like Europe at the time. They were the hotspot for universities, for astronomy, for arts, for technologies, everything from paper to tempered steel, um, passed through these societies where ideas were exchanged, and it was the actual potpourri, the mix of ideas that made them great and made them shine, and effectively ignited um, the golden age of Islamic learning. What happened later provided a lesson to me as I inched out of that landscape because all of those cities and all of those places now are either preserved as archaeological sites or are rubble. I walked through for two and a half years the rubble of the Silk Road because not only were they bypassed in trade routes, but they experienced an inward turn late um, in the 10th century where they no longer were as receptive to outside ideas or outside people. And at that point began the decline. So that was another lesson, again, about how we're gonna get by in a world that is increasingly polarized, a world that sometimes feels like it's getting more and more xenophobic, where walls are going up paradoxically instead of coming down in an age of globalism. The final example I can offer and share about this long stroll across continents that might um, be a hint at how we can try to navigate the Anthropocene and all the issues of sustainability that comes with it about using increasingly smaller shares of resources would be India. So I spent 17 months walking across Northern India, almost 4,000 kilometers. And India as some of you might know, was one of the early um, adopters of the Green Revolution technologies that allowed us to feed our global family. Genetically modified foods, um, high yield crops, the use of fossil fuels to pump groundwater to drastically and radically increase yields. All of this was great back in the 60s and 70s, right? But what's happened 
the after effect, the hangover of the Green Revolution in India was one of the most sobering environmental stories that I've walked through in my entire career. and certainly the most daunting one on this long foot journey. India is now going through the most serious water crisis of any country in the world. They are not just running out of water in which to drink and to grow their foods and to, to, to stoke their industries, but water quality is now highly compromised by pesticides, by chemicals. 600 million people in India are affected by this crisis, either water shortages or water quality issues. Up to 200,000 people a year are dying because of the water crisis in India. It is so big of a problem that it almost feeds denial. It's too big of an issue, too big of a tragedy to get your head around. And I walked through it for almost a year and a half. What are the solutions? Nobody really seems to have a handle on it yet. I don't know where India is going to go with its water woes. The government has been proposing massive terraforming schemes like river linking, joining massive rivers together to basically reshape the hydrology of an entire subcontinent. But what stood out for me, again, as an example, at boot level, face to face, eye to eye with Indian farmers, were the measures being taken by local communities to be more sustainable with the resources that they had and smarter, smaller, but smarter. They were dealing, um, digging tens of thousands of, of small wells, surface wells to capture surface water, rainfall. They were adapting old crops that were better adapted to drought conditions to feed themselves, reaching back into human memory for examples of ancient technologies that are going to serve us well as we move into the new century. So what I want to just say is that the walk has been like a, a necklace of beads and every bead is a human story. And there have been tens of thousands of them that I've encountered with a hello along the trail or spending a week with one family or spending months in one town. But the beads that I leave you with from my trail, we can rub for our fingers as we walk together like prayer beads going forward is look for rain like the nomads of Ethiopia and share what you have like the refugees of Syria and tear down the walls around your community to share the ideas and ideals of openness of the Great Silk Road and go back into memory to, to mine the wisdom of the ancients to help us see our way through things like the water crisis of India. We are an amazing problem solving species. We've got lots of problems, most of them created by ourselves and we have to resolve them. But our ancestors, the one who walked across the earth back in the Pleistocene, those hunters and gatherers that I'm following from campfire to campfire, they were master problem solvers. They problem solved their ways across unknown landscapes. We've got to continue using those muscles. And I, I've got to think that we will. I am so delighted to share this with you. And uh, I've been working with Esri almost from the very beginning to map this journey and uh, look forward to continuing ahead. Uh, there's still a long way to go. All, the, uh, all of China, all of Siberia, all of the Americas. So I um, hope to be seeing you out on the trail.